Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Amanda Boydovich, and I'm the president of the Friends of the Airport. And out at the desk, you can find a brochure with information about how to join us. Um, today, I'm introducing Kate Vermeer. It is Vermeer. Yeah. Yes, I always wonder. Kate is highly qualified. She's got a Bachelor of Arts in History. She's got a. She can't hear me. That's unbelievable. That's a rare. That's rare. It is rare. Can you hear me now? I'm introducing Kate Vermey. She has a Bachelor of Arts in History, a Bachelor of Education in Early Years, an Associate Degree in Social Sciences. She's currently doing a Graduate Diploma in Family History and a Graduate Diploma of Record Management and Archives. She used to be the Director of Boarding at Collegiate before joining Libraries Tasmania in 2012. Put up your hands if you were a collegiate girl. Who knew her? <laughs> Um, and she really loves discovering the uh, private stories behind this public family, this Allport family. Now, today's story is the fourth. It's become a series. I've just suggested to her it's a book or a PhD. And um, this one is, she ranges fairly widely across. So the first two were about Curzon, naughty, horrible Curzon. Um, and the second, the third one was about uh, Annie, his wife's, his long-suffering wife's father. This one is about the diaries of Mary Morton Allport's mother. Not an Allport out here, but an Allport in Birmingham, England. And I commend Kate's talks to you because they are usually absolutely delightful. Kate Verme. Usually. Usually. <laughs> I like Thanks, Amanda. I, I do like that word, usually. Now the expectations really are. <laughs> You're right, Cliff? Okay. Okay, so as I keep being reminded, I only have an hour for this talk. And those of you that know me, or those of you who have heard my talks before, will know that I can talk about this family forever. And I often do. Just ask my SLAS teammates. Um, so when I sat down and started really looking at this talk, I realised that there was no way I was going to be able to cover it in just one talk. So there will be a second one, most likely in August, so keep an eye out for that. So along with that, let's have a look at Anne Floyd Chapman. So March is Women's History Month, and the theme this year is celebrating women who tell our stories. Therefore, I feel it is very fortuitous that I'm giving this talk about an ordinary woman telling the story of everyday life of her family, her community, her friends and her time. When I first started reading the diaries, I initially felt as if I was reading a Jane Austen novel, hence the title, albeit without the romantic hero and heroine or indeed the social class structures that so often characterise Austen's work. What the diaries or journals, as she refers to them as, of Anne Floyd Chapman Nee Evert, the mother of Mary Morton Allport, gives us, the reader, is an inside glimpse into a mother's love, loss and grief. It shares with us the highest of highs and the lowest of lows of family life, along with the occasional spot of gossip and the odd hanging. They, her sons William and Thomas, have been to Chepstow Castle and saw the wicked Mrs. Birderock hung for poisoning her neighbour, she writes on the 20th of April, 1835. And again, in April of the same year, the two desperate characters that murdered Mr. Painter was hung at Warwick this morning and richly deserved their fate. These diaries provide us with a social commentary much as Austen's work does, centred around one family with a myriad of peripheral characters who bring their stories to life. Originally written for her daughter, Mary Morton Allport, as a record of the family and the life she left behind, they are nonetheless the private thoughts and recollections of Anne Floyd, the singular author, and it is through her eyes that we get these stories. Sometimes they were written on the day and sometimes written in retrospect. The pages are filled with amusing anecdotes, terrible losses, and wonderful accounts of late Georgian and early Victorian Birmingham and surrounds. The existing diaries and journals are comprised of five incomplete manuscripts and total over 150 pages when transcribed. Written by Anne Floyd Chapman from her 
home in the Castle Inn and High Street, Birmingham and Warwickshire, they start on the 11th of May, 1834, with the words, journal continued. We have no way of knowing how many diaries or journals came before this date, or indeed when it was that Anne Floyd started writing them. We are, however, extremely fortunate to have as much of these journals left that we, as we do. They are incredibly fragile and in poor condition, and it's taken me months to read and transcribe these existing manuscripts and to do this I worked from photographs of each page as the manuscripts themselves were much too fragile to handle without risk of further damage so I'll just show you a couple of photos oh that's a quote that she writes but poor old Mary so that is a couple of the covers that we have that's a couple of the pages so that's actually, that's her neat writing. That's her, mm -hmm. that's her neat writing. To understand the journals, it is important that I give you a brief background on Mary, of Anne Floyd Chapman Neen Ebbett, her time, her home, and the main players in these diaries, to orient ourselves in her personal story and life, and to recognise that what she wrote within the pages was for a particular audience, that of her daughter. And this colours her writing and dictates what she includes, and perhaps, almost as importantly, what she may have left out. Anne Floyd Ebbett was born on the 6th of December in 1778 to Humphrey Ebbett and his wife Anne Floyd. Yes, I know, they like the family name. Bear with me. Um, she married William Chapman, or Mr C, as she refers to him, on the 20th of January in 1799. Humphrey Ebbett and Anne Floyd's father started his working life as a cordwainer or shoemaker in Worcester before relocating to Birmingham, Warwickshire and working his way up to being a relatively successful innkeeper and coach proprietor. By the time of his death in 1833, he had accumulated quite a few properties, including a house at Prospect Hill. Ooh, oh, there's my Floyds and my Abbots. So they are, as far as I can tell in our collection, the only images that we have of um, Mary Morton's parents. And I'm sorry, the photographs are a bit dodgy, but I had to take them in situ where they're in their special casings. I couldn't take them out, so there they are. Oh, we do have one more. Oh, there we go, Prospect Hill. So there we go. So that was done by Mary Morton Allport. It's a sketch of her grandfather's house, Prospect Hill. So Prospect Hill, you'll hear me talk about that a few times in this talk. It was the Ebbett family home and um, Anne Floyd's sister, Mary, is the one that lives in it as we are talking about this time period. And the Castle Inn, which will play a central role in Anne Floyd's writings. So that's the Castle Inn, that is the one in High Street in Birmingham. Um, I don't know if you can see it because it's a bit of a dodgy capture that I've got there, but above... Oh, yeah, stick. It does. It does actually say Chapman above the second window, so you've got those doors in it, so it does say Chapman. So Humphrey and Anne B. E. Floyd had three surviving children, including Anne Floyd, daughter Mary Ebbett, later Mary Partridge, or Aunt P, and son James Ebbett in 1783, both of whom pop up in their sister's journal with, oh, thanks, Clifford. <laughs> Brother James is not always in so a flattering a light. On the 27th of August, 1834, she writes, James Ebbett came from London last night and went home today as he has a touch of the cholera. Mr Davis tells us many people are dead from it, but you were pleased to know that James Ebbett did indeed survive. Throughout the diaries, we get a sense of feeling of animosity towards her brother and despair towards the situation in which her father has left her. You see, in 1833, when their father Humphrey died, his will makes quite a pointed reference to Anne Floyd's husband, William Chapman. Humphrey names his daughter Mary Ebbett, son James Ebbett, his solicitor Roger Williams and future son-in-law Samuel Partridge as executors of his will. He bequeaths to his daughter Mary and son James sums of money, as well as the following freeholds, leaseholds, and personal property in trust for my daughter, Anne Chapman, all my shares in the Birmingham Coal Company, which turns out to be a bit of a disaster, associated freeholds, dwelling houses, and premises to said James Ebbett and Mary Ebbett in trust. And they were to hold the profits of these for my daughter, Anne Chapman, 
for her natural life and for her own soul and separate use and benefit, and for which her estate alone shall be the only good and proper discharge. He makes express mention that these profits are not to be subject or liable to the debt, management or interference of her present or any future husband, and from and after the decease of Anne Chapman, to sell and dispose of the free of the said freeholds and leaseholds and dwelling houses, with the profits to be distributed to, my, to the children of my said daughter, Anne Chapman, except for her eldest, grand, her eldest son, Thomas. Interesting, isn't it, that these conditions were placed on Anne Floyd's inheritance and not her sister's, who, although unmarried at the time of their father's death, was to marry the following year. There was no mention of her inheritance being protected from any future husband. Perhaps their father had examined his son-in-law's character and found him wanting, or maybe he just wanted to protect Anne Floyd from having her inheritance potentially squandered and her being left with nothing. Either way, it would appear that he valued his, older, his other children's judgments and abilities to handle money over his eldest daughters, given that the siblings, Mary and James Everett, were given control over Anne Floyd's shares in the form of a trust. So the castle on Birmingham, on High Street in Birmingham, as our buildings were bequeathed to James Ebbett, even though Anne Floyd and her husband William Chapman had lived on the premises since at least 1818. The loss of the crown seems to be particularly painful for Anne Floyd, who on the July the 26th, 1834, writes, I have been dreaming of my father. I wonder if he can look down and see how he has left me situated in this terrestrial world. I am troubled and wonder how his judgment must have been deceived to have left me so little in comparison with my brother. For my sister, I say nothing. My father ought to have left me the castle. He used to say he bought it purposely to place me there. His mind must have been biased. God rest his soul. All I can say is may God prosper my pittance to my children and give me contentment, and there I shall have all the greatest of riches. On August 13, 1834, Anne Floyd once again bemoans her inheritance. The new assessment has rose our levies considerably and everything else in proportion and business is decreasing. Oh, my father, what did you leave me so situated is not justice and so everybody says. And no child felt more of my father's infirmaries than myself or has been more anxious to render him for the offices of kindness. I have been too tenacious and have had too honourable a teaching or I should have talked to my father, which I never did in my life. Excluding a few other bequests for his, to his grandchildren, including Thomas Chapman, son of Anne Floyd, a coachman who was left a share of his grandfather's coach proprietor's stock for his own use and benefit, the rest of Humphrey's estate was divided between his three children, James, Mary and Anne Floyd, with Anne Floyd's share once again to be used only for her own sole separate use and subject. At the time of Anne Floyd's writing, England was undergoing a period of great change. The country had come through the Napoleonic Wars, the madness of King George III, the Regency period, and it were in the final years of the reign of King William IV. The population was rising, but employment was not, and social reform was in full swing as workers fought not to be replaced by machines. The Industrial Revolution was well and truly in progress, and the introduction of the railways in the 1830s and 40s were the ramifications for the Chapman as a family who depended on coach travel for their survival in the years to come. As we've established the background in which Anne Floyd writes her diaries, I shall now introduce you to her rather large family. We know, of course, that Anne Floyd was writing for her daughter, Mary Morton Allport, who had by now left the Chapman family base in Birmingham and started a new life with her husband, Joseph Allport, and their son, Morton, in Van Diemen's Land. But what of Mary's siblings? How did their lives fare back home? I'll start with James Everett Chapman, not to be confused with his uncle James Everett, as, a story, as his story is intertwined with Mary Morton's at the start of their mother's journals. James Everett Chapman had joined with Joseph Orport and William Ward. So William Ward um, was connected to the um, Orport family through Joseph Orport's brother John, who married Ward's sister Anne. Are we following? Yeah. <laughs> okay. In the, new, in the new adventures in Van Diemen's land, their hopes of a establishing themselves as farmers and business partners in the colonies. Unfortunately, this was not to be, and the partnership was dissolved between the parties in 1832, a mere months after their arrival in Van Diemen's Land. On the 5th of October, 1832, a notice was placed in the Hobart Town Courier announcing 
lasting that effect. effect. Notice is hereby given that the partnership heretofore subsisting between the undersigned Joseph Walford, William Ward and James Everett Chapman as farmers at Blackbrush was on the first day of September instant dissolved by mutual consent and that the same business will in future be carried on by the said William Ward and James Everett Chapman on their separate account. James Everett Chapman was born around 1804. He was baptised with his brother Thomas at the, um, in that year, so he was kind of around there, in Birmingham, Warwickshire, and he was the third surviving son of Anne Floyd and William's 11 children. Only seven survived to adulthood. He married his wife, Eliza Hart, who will become the sub of many of Anne Floyd's writings as the years progress, and they married on the 10th of October 1828. The couple had two children, Anne, or wait for it, Annie Floyd Everett Chapman, <laughs> born on the 9th of June 1830, before they set out for Van Diemen's Land, and James Morton, or Jim, Jimmy Chapman, born on the 30th of November 1834, while the family were in Van Diemen's Land. Anne Floyd dedicates much of her early writings to her two missing children. She grieves for having left her forever and has a constant wish that they will one day return to her. I need no pot, um, so Mary used to send preserves, pots of preserves from Van Diemen's Land back home to England. So I need no pot to remind me of my dear Mary. She and James are ever in my thoughts. I only wish I had it in my power to extricate them from all their difficulties. She writes on July 9th, 1834. Two days later, on July 11th, 1834, she writes, This morning I received my dear grandchildren's miniatures. My godson Morton is a beautiful boy, and dear Anne, so Anne Floyd Everett Chapman, and Marissa, who is Minnie Louise Allport, she was later known as Minnie, are sweet children. And the fingers of my children have been very beautifully painted them. I cannot help shedding tears. They will flow, though I try to prevent it. When I parted from Mary, I thought it was only for a time. I did not think it was forever. I never let my mind imagine that. And now I feel as if it was. Her and that dear babe would not have been torn from me so easily. But it is perhaps God's will, and I must not dwell upon it. A mother's love and grief that she may never see her beloved children and grandchildren again can be felt throughout her writings, especially as James Everett Chapman seems to find himself in more trouble than not in the far-off colony of Van Diemen's Land. I dreamt last night of James and Eliza were in my bedroom. Eliza looking fat and well, and James looking thin and old. He was trying to get something with a stick off the top of the bed, and myself and Eliza were sitting by the fire. I thought I was asking Eliza about the climate of Van Diemen's Land, and thought I had done as though I had done so many times over. Perhaps when I am old, they will return, and I shall do so. I pray to God they will return. On August 13, 1835, Anne laments that she has received no letters from James. It is strange James does not write, poor fellow. I fear he is badly off. Oh, why did he leave his native land? Oh, why my heart bleeds for my children, so far removed from me? Many a pang you have cost me. It is 12 months since James wrote, and not even one letter since he saw Humphrey. So um, Humphrey was his brother who used to travel out to the colonies. He was a captain. In 18... 18- in 1934, James Everett Chapman goes into business with Mr Alfred Betts, who had travelled with the party on the Plantina from England to Van Diemen's Land in 1831. And the Betts family were known to the Chapmans and Allports. Um, Joseph's brother, Henry Curzon Allport, marries Bertha Betts, and they too settle in the colonies, although they settle in New South Wales. So you can see there's lots of family connections there. This would prove to be a very very unwise decision, and the Betts family would become the victims of much scorn at the hands of Anne Floyd's pen, but we will get back to them later. Now let's run through the rest of the family. Anne and William's eldest daughter, Anne Frances, or Fanny, was born in 1799 and married merchant Henry Edwards in 1823. They had nine children, two of whom, Sarah and Jane, as adults, would make their way to their aunt, Mary Moore in Tasmania, and Sarah would actually become Mary Mott's companion in the years before her death. Um, she was known as Aunt Sarah, and she actually did get caught up in the whole hers and all ports dastardly deeds with Mary Morton's will after the death of Mary Morton. So, <laughs> um, Jane went on to marry Frederick John Beck, and they settled in South Australia, but they did visit with Mary Morton Allport and her family in 1853. And Mary writes very fondly of their time together in her journal to Morton, to her son Morton, of that same year. Fanny and Edward's son 
Um, P. Edwards would also become infamous in his own right when in 1856 his father Henry Edwards dissolved their business relationship. A short two years later in 1860, John P. is declared bankrupt, charged with forgery and absconds to the continent under a false name only to be captured in Stockholm in June in 1860 and returned to Birmingham to face trial. He was sentenced to seven years penal servitude in August 1860, and in February 1861, he was declared insane and removed to a lunatic asylum, Hatton Asylum to be precise. He was discharged in 1863 and became a clerk, so I think things worked out okay. Next, we have the somewhat hapless Thomas Chapman, who married Marion Prentice in 1833 and was a recipient of his grandfather's generosity in having received the bequest of his coach proprietor stock. Unfortunately for Thomas and his partners James and John Thomas Brown, the business did not thrive as it had under his grandfather. And Anne Floyd writes the about the trials and tribulations of Thomas in her diary. We will see what she says in due course. Captain Humphrey Chapman, the surviving son number three, was based in Porto, Portugal, where he married his wife Margaret Augusta Smythe in 1837. And he frequented, frequently returned to Birmingham via Liverpool when on leave and occasionally sailed to the colonies where he would see his sister Mary. William Chapman, William Floyd Chapman, Anne and William's final surviving son, was born in 1815 and was a coach builder, and he married Emma Greatwood in 1836. And lastly, we have Louisa Harriet, born in 1816, the Chapman's final surviving child, and she married her first husband, Charles Mucklow, in 1833. So now we've been acquainted with the main players, let's see what their mother has to say about them and those in their, her, their society. We pick up the diary in May 16, 1834, when she's visiting her son Humphrey and friends in Liverpool. Unfortunately for Anne Floyd, she has a small accident while she is there, writing, I've had a sad fall over a log of wood. The log was deeper than I expected and I could not get my leg over it and pitched on my head. There I lay until I was helped up by two sailors. One great feeling pulled out a blue pocket kerchief and very oddly wiped my face down from the dust, hoping I was not hurt. I have bruised both my knees dreadfully and they are very painful. She didn't, however, manage to attend the theatre that night to see Keane perform. However, there were very few persons there. Returning to her home in Birmingham on the 20th of May, 1834, Anne Freud writes, much fatigued, I think I shall take no more long journeys. I am weak in my pins, as Mr Chapman says. It wasn't just to Liverpool where Anne Floyd travelled. Despite claiming that she would no longer undertake long journeys again, she does embark on a trip to London. She does embark on trips to London and Margate in the summertime, often with her sister Mary and all her daughters Fanny Edwards and Louisa Mucklow. On one of these trips in July 1834, Anne Floyd writes about wanting her daughter Louise to go with her, but is disappointed as Louise's husband cannot spare her. 19th of July. I've been asking Charles to let Louisa go with me to Margate, but I fear he cannot spare her. July 20th. Charles declines letting Louisa go to Margate. It is a reminder that despite the changes in society and that in a few short years a new queen would be on the throne, women were still very much subject to the will of their husbands and fathers. Louisa did, however, end up going with Anne and Mrs. C on the 7th of August. She writes, arrived in London at half past six, breakfasted, Mr. C and Louisa came with me. We went to London Bridge and set out by the magnet steamer for Margate. The visit did not last long, however. On the 12th of August, she writes, Dear Louisa, went to London in the Royal George steamer, much to our grief. Charles discovered the servant a thief. He was to write if she could stay. He did not do so, so she would go. It has quite upset me, and never more will I attempt to bring her from home again. However, her health may require it. She is so cheerful and happy, and her father loves her company, and so do I, but she is lost to us now. In brackets, she adds, it was all very well that she went home for her servant was a most wicked little wench. So perhaps she has forgiven her son-in-law for taking Louisa away after all. Unfortunately for Anne Floyd and Mr. C, the illness is to keep them from enjoying their holiday. And Anne Floyd writes that she is very poorly, due mainly to the heat of the season. Very, very hot. I could scarce bear it. I did not move again till the evening was so poorly. And on the 16th, she writes, Mr. C is very sick. We never went out. Her holiday, did, her holiday did improve with a break in the oppressive weather and she writes on the 21st of August 1834, the heat is excessive. Mr Tansy came and dined with us and left us after tea when heavy thunder and vivid lightning began. Afterwards heavy rain. 
and never saw such lightning. It began with shift and ended with forked. Every flash was like heat from an oven. It continued a little all night, but it was very beautiful to look at. Mr. C went to the smoke room before it began, so I was solaced but not afraid, knowing that there is a good protector above who will remove me when he thinks he's proper. My absent children occupied my mind. Anne Floyd enjoyed her time in Margate, visiting the local spike from the seaside. On her way back to London, she stops by Canterbury Cathedral, which was a great disappointment to me. <laughs> Arriving in London on the 24th of August, 1834, she writes, arrived at the Saracen Head at half past six o'clock. Took supper, having had nothing since breakfast, wrote home, was put to sleep in a room I slept in with my poor mother 36 years ago before I was married. Have never been here since. So the Saracen's Head was one of her father's interests. We now jump back to 1834 when on the 7th of July, through Anne Floyd's somewhat biased eyes, we start to see the unravelling of James Everett Chapman's business enterprises in Van Diemen's land. He may well be half a world away, but his mother was certainly kept well informed of his struggles. Mr Betts, so remember the Betts family? I remember Alfred Betts is with the family in Van Diemen's land. Yeah. Mr Betts has a letter from Alfred. Oh, sorry, and one from James enclosing a cheque for £140, which he does not know what to do with, being no other directions other than saying that Alfred will tell them what to do with it. And Alfred does not name it in his letter. Mr Edwards, so uh, her son in law, Mr Edwards, thinks it is very strange that James did not send it to him. Alfred writes a long letter, and James is very short. Mr Betts came to Mr Edwards to know if he had a letter. What can James be thinking of? On June 15, 1834, Anne Floyd receives a letter from her son James. His statement of events have much surprised me. Old Mr. Betts has been working like a mole underground to enrich his family, and there has been regular communication between Alfred, him, and Allport. Alfred has, in his letters, said Mr. Edwards tells me that Allport was and is doing well, but that he had got a whimsical and extravagant wife and laid James down in a vile manner. He has been a complete Jonas. James is made a duke, but I trust he will not remove him from the farm without remuneration. He cannot without his own assent, and I hope he will not be intimidated to do it. Henry Edwards has brought me a letter he wrote to Joseph Allport, wherein he names James having a commission of 450 pounds. What a creature that Alfred must be to dare write home such anything to do with the prejudice of my dear Mary after all the kindness she has shown him. June 17th. This morning has come a letter from James and one from Mary. We are astonished at Mr. Betts' conduct and do not understand how he can have the power to dissolve the partnership, nor is it to be done till all the debts are paid. Poor James, your eyes ought to have been opened sooner, but I hope and pray that blight and misfortune will fall on such deceivers that they have been carrying on two faces in this business, and may their conscience go to them day and night, and may all their prospects be blighted. I don't think she's very happy. June 19th, Henry has written to James, so Henry Edwards, has written to James and as soon as he has seen what he will seal it and I will send mine also. Now many tears I have shed for him, a bet the ungrateful puppy. I had such person to and his name I will never utter but when obligated and I am quite out of spirits. In short, I am miserable, everything goes wrong. Old Mr. Betts called upon me and I'm quite bewildered about the affairs in Hobart Town. Mr. Betts says James never went into town without the community. He has been a fool, but he has not brought them into and but he has not brought them into all difficulties as I tell him. The money for all the goods has been spent on the farm, where so many workmen had to be maintained at so high a price of provisions, and it is very well this very well to lay blame on James, poor fellow, but I am not much deceived. On James's birthday, on the 25th of July, 1834, she writes, my poor James's birthday. What is he doing, I wonder? Oh, how many anxious moments does he cause me? He is ever in my mind in his little family. I have had no sleep these two nights, troubled about many things. I dreamed again of my father on June 27th. I got a letter from dear Fanny, and she says, Aunt C. So Aunt C, wait for it, is Mary Morton Chaplin, who is William Chaplin's sister. So she is the sister-in-law of Anne Floyd. And a letter, Fanny says, Aunt C has a letter from Joseph and Mary, and there is one line for Aunt P, so 
Part P, Mary Everett Partridge, who was the sister of Anne Floyd. From James, I trust that contained more favourable intelligence than we have received lately. From James's misfortunes, we moved to Thomas's. On June 18, 1834, she writes, Poor Thomas is sadly distressed. A very terrible accident has happened to the express coming down the hill, 10 persons injured. And Mrs H has had her leg and part of her thigh taken off. Persons lie at Mr Leap's four at another place. What the expense will be is dreadful to think of. They have just paid £300 for one accident and £250 fell to Tom and James Brown's share. Troubles never come alone. Tom says Mr Cox is like a madman. All these accidents have occurred to the express. The first began the day of my poor father's death. More troubles before Thomas. On the 25th of June, 1834, Tom's luggage horse was killed. It ran away and the shaft of Pickford's wagon ran into its chest and he died in a few minutes. It has made me quite ill. Nothing but misfortune. But it's not just his son's troubles that Anne Floyd's faced with. Hardship seems to follow her. While on holiday in July 1834, she receives a letter from home. I hear by letters that heavy rain has been at Birmingham. Our market room was deluged. The rain got between the roof and the ceiling and it came through like a shower bath and ran down the stairs like a natural cascade. It will put us to the expense of now doing up the room. These constant worries, however, do not, do not however, I am pleased to report, preclude Anne Floyd from enjoying her sojourn. She enjoys outings, visits for tea with friends and acquaintances, and although the rain has prevented my going to call on my brother James, she does read, she does reading, she goes to trips to the zoological gardens, the London Bridge, the British Museum, and Vauxhall, where she was to singing, fireworks, ventriloquism, and polar penguin shows. She shares the kindness she has received from friends such as the Dave who want me to stop longer but I'm anxious to be home and how they are accompanying her partway on her journey back to Birmingham, her husband William having returned earlier. I must leave off and wait the arrival of the coach. Mr Davies is kindly awaiting, kindly going with me to Tollington's. Lucy is growing so fat that Mary is as thin as ever. I think Anne Packwood and George Natalie will make a match of it. I have no idea who these people are but I'm sure Mary enjoyed this little bit of information. Returning home, Anne Floyd is met with the news that Mary has been ill, James is in more trouble, and Thomas has gone to Sully Hall as the standard coach upset and killed two of the horses. Nothing but misfortune for Thomas. I'm not sure about you, but I'm going to think that Thomas should probably start looking into other occupations. This one does not seem to be turning out so well for him or his horses. The rest of 1834 passes with Anne Floyd documenting the daily struggles of being an innkeeper. Not one bed we had occupied last night. This will never pay the rent. So under the terms of her father's will, she pays £75 a quarter to her brother for rent for the castle. She pays and receives calls. Mrs Woodfields came. Mr C and I went to the cottage. Miss Chapman is taken there and we drank tea with her. Sewing shirts for her grandchildren. Working hard at Little Jem's shirts. I hope they will arrive safe. Dealing with her own illnesses. Keeping up with the town's gossip writing and receiving letters, visiting botanical shows, evenings out at the theatre, going to parties and celebrating birthdays. Wednesday I'm going to a large party at Prospect Hill so that Everett family home where her sister is and to another there on Friday. How shall I ever be able to manage it? I can't say. December 6th is my birthday and I have now completed 55 years. Um, she later corrects this because she's actually miscalculated and She's a year older than she thinks. I don't know why she corrected that, but she did. Um, and I have various trials I have sustained, and God has hither or to God has hitherto been merciful to me, and I trust he will continue to be so. Of the party she attended at Prospect Hill, she writes, the second entertainment at my sister's more splendid than the last. 62 persons, music, dancing, singing, and cards. But the happiness of these occasions is somewhat overshadowed by the constant and increasing worries Anne Floyd has for her family, both at home and abroad. September 1834 sees her granddaughter Louisa Edwards struck down with rheumatic fever. Godso, so Sarah Godso or Gadso, depending on which version you look at, is the family's nurse and she lives with the family at the Castle Hill and is just quite an important figure later on. Um, Gadso went to see Louisa Edwards, who has rheumatic fever. She cannot stand on either leg. In October 1834, Louisa suffered a paralytic stroke, but has recovered the use of her limbs, except for her leg. On October the 5th, 1834, 
Anne Floyd receives a letter from James and one Mary had written to her aunt Partridge. The letter from Mary to her aunt recounts her illness and causes her mother to cry that she grieves to hear of her illness. I shall never see her no more. Oh, my poor child, you will never know the tears I have shed for you. Christmas Eve celebrations that year saw Anne Floyd host a large party to play cards, drink toast and ale, and a very fine kissing bush was hung up and all enjoyed themselves. We drank to absent friends. On Christmas Day, we spent with her children, Tom and Louisa, and their spouses, where they played cards all afternoon, drank to the health of our absent children. But it was the first Christmas Day for many years. None of my family had dined at Prospect Hill. July 1835, an Aunt Floyd reports that the doctor has ordered a light iron to support Louisa Edwards' leg and knee, and that her son, William, was very ill. January 16, 1835. William is very ill this morning. Mr Partridge bled him in the arm this morning and at night he's 12 leeches on his chest. I am very miserable to have both him and his father laid up. January 18. My dear child is very ill. Mr P has bled him in the arm again and I am wretched and my poor husband is no better. His inflammation is on his liver. William's is on his lung. January 20. Mr C is a little better. William is not yet out of danger and he continues to spit blood. Mr Partridge fears he is going into decline. William has more leeches applied to his side, which Anne Floyd put on myself and it left him very low. So here's a nice picture of a leech jar. That's nice. Yeah, see, I think it might make it pretty. You know, it's fine. I think leeches are making a comeback in medicine. Make it. Everything on his new again. Um, he does thankfully improve though, slowly, William. As Louisa Edwards, Mr. C and William continue to recuperate, Anne Floyd intersperses tales of their recovery with stories of those in town who have not been so lucky. Poor Dr. Covey has met with a dreadful accident. Mr. Stoven and him were out shooting and in going through a hedge, the gun went off and shot Mr. Covey through the heart. He is brought home a corpse. He has left a wife and four little, I oh, know, she's pretty lovely for him. <laughs> he has left a wife and four little children and just getting into good practice. It is a melancholy event. Indeed, Anne Floyd, indeed. On, June, on January 30th, 1835, she writes, buried Charles Rakewood at St Martin's and William Haywood's wife was buried yesterday. And on February the 3rd, 1834, this one's a little bit squeamy, so you might want to cover your ears if you... <laughs> Poor Ed Thornby died yesterday at Henley. He was wasted to a skeleton. Mr. P and Bartlett, so another doctor in the area, went to open his head where they found water and a kind of cancerous brain. He had been blind for some time and fed with a teaspoon on port wine with an egg beat in it. Late February, Anne Floyd receives a letter from her son Humphrey and a packet from Mary. The packet contains beautifully painted pictures of her grandchildren. Morton's for Aunt P, both Thomas and myself, covered for a brooch. Anne Floyd takes the pictures with her to visit with the old horse at Aldridge, who were very much pleased to see us and delighted with the paintings. So even though um, Aldridge was technically in Staffordshire, with all the way the, the, they were very, very close to each other, so they used to travel and visit quite often. So the pain of the absence of lost children is not Anne Floyd's to bear alone, and she recognises that the Allport family also had suffered the same loss with the departure of their son, Joseph. Anne Floyd writes often about her visits with Joseph's parents in Aldridge and how they shared the grief of being parted from their loved ones. I see a vessel has arrived, direct from Hobart Town, the Caroline. It sailed on the 9th of February. No letter for me yet. When to Aldridge to see Mary's letter and the dear old people were much delighted. The poor old gent is almost worn out. He told me while we were walking in the garden and a beautiful garden it is that he had hoped to see Mary and Joseph again but now he had relinquished all hope. As time progresses and the loss of their children to Van Diemen's land seems to weigh heavily on the hearts of the Allports and Chapmans. On a visit in 1835 Anne Floyd writes, Miss Chapman himself went to Aldridge to take Mrs. Orport's pot of preserves Mary had sent. It was very delicious. It tasted more like apricots or plums than our gooseberries. But we found a great change in Mrs. Orport. Hope seems to have forsaken her and she has become very deaf. We have all shed tears together. I have felt quite miserable and dear old Mr. Orport's tears have quite overwhelmed me. He is a thin, old, little man. 
I wish they could let their house, for it is too large for three persons, yet they will feel they will regret to leave it. I saw the building of it from its foundation. By June 1835, however, Anne Floyd was celebrating another addition to her family with the birth of her granddaughter, Georgiana Edwards. Born on July, June 23rd, at seven o'clock this morning, I was fetched to dear Fanny, at half past nine, she was first put to bed of a little girl, making her eighth child and sixth daughter. She has a comfortable nurse. Fanny exclaimed while making her comfortable, poor Mary and her drunken nurse. So in 1832 and 33, Mary Morton has a journal and she writes about her, her initial um, time in, in Van Diemen's land. And one of the things she writes about is how she had terrible trouble with the convict nurses of, the, of, the, of her early days and they would often be getting drunk and stealing stuff. And so she frequently had to send them back to the factory time after time after time. So poor Fanny is very lucky she got a good one. Poor Mary didn't, apparently. Anne Lloyd's happiness at the birth of the sweet, good creature is short-lived when Thomas and his business partner, James Brown, suffer the death of another horse. The poor black, I know, the poor black horse was killed. He was our best riding horse and such a safe one for the gig could not be equaled. As Anne Floyd herself said, it is distressing and very unfortunate the number of coach accidents. Thomas's business is sinking fast. I am very low spirited on Tom's account. He is so crippled with want of money to carry on his business. And he faces a trial to be held in August of 1835, where Anne Floyd herself is called to testify. The thoughts of this trial make me ill and anxious for Tom and James, and anxiety for Tom and James Brown overpowers me. The saga that was Thomas and James' business affairs continued to dominate Anne Floyd's writing into the second half of 1835. The 30th of August, 1835, Louisa and I went to tea to Henry Edwards. Fanny tells me James and Hobbes, who was another associate of Van Diemen's Land, are parted and that James was drunk from morning till night and that Hobbes had given James a hundred pounds to get shut of him. Poor unfortunate fellow. Who is the cause of this and why was he persuaded to leave his home and country? I can only pray for his, his, his pursuing a different line of conduct and hope that he will think how it places his wife and children. I have passed a miserable night thinking of him, how my child has fallen. God protect him and his family, my poor James, what shall I hear next? It must have been very heart-wrenching for Anne Floyd to know the dire straits her son was in and knowing there was nothing she could do for him. To have to endure the months between letters and waiting for any tiny drip of intelligence to reach her, to give her some assurance that he was well, that all would be settled, and that James and his family would return to her. She frequently punctuates her narratives on James with God's will be done, as if it is often too much for her to bear, and he's handing it all over to her God, knowing that there is nothing she can do to change his will. I imagine this gave her some form of comfort. The blame of James's predicament, however, she does lay firmly at the feet of the Betts family, a mother's love perhaps blinding her to her own son's fault. On September 6, 1835, thinking of many things and hoping and wishing the debts due to the many creditors here from Hobart Town was paid, those Betts have paid no one, and still we are given to understand the young ones having a property at the bush are accountable. They seem instead of paying off their debts to make it their business to write unfavourable accounts of James, who amongst them they have driven to desperation nearly, and he is, he is, he like a fool has let them. If he was not speaking for James, their hated name would not pass my lips. Let James be what he may, that Alfred Betts is an ungrateful, deceitful wretch. He has sent more than one unpleasant remark of Mary. I wonder she should paint his miniature. Oh dear, but the distance is too great to enter into many details. Why are the debts not paid here? James could then come home and be out of sight of those who think him obnoxious. I wish Mr. Orpah would employ his pen otherwise than writing to old Betts unpleasant things about my son. What is it to do with old Betts? Mr. A may think what he pleases, but he has brought great responsibility on himself. I wish to give Mr. A credit for all that he is due, and I am sorry that he induced James to go. I fear poor Joseph Allport has not been spared the wrath of his mother-in-law either. It is not all doom and gloom, however, between all the hardships and the pain of her children's various woes, Anne Floyd drops in of humorous and sometimes pithy comments. On April 23, 1835, while visiting the Bordley Botanical Show with a Mr. and Mrs. Hopkins from 
Dreamington, she writes of Mrs. Hopkins, she's quite fat, twice my size. On other outing, this time to the Botanical Gardens on July the 3rd, she writes, went to the Botanical Gardens with Marion, Miss Hind and Miss Edwards, a most beautiful assembly of fine dresses, but set of the ugliest women I ever saw. <laughs> Show of fruit and flowers, very inferior to ours at Bordley. Her writing often jumps from lamenting her loss her lot in life to blithely commenting that someone in the community has had a baby, been married, gone mad, or died. Mr. Thomas, Mr. Johnson, a tax collector, fell down dead opposite Mr. Edwards' shop, she writes. Fanny and the children went for a walk to look after Mr. Look after Mrs. Boyles last night and found that she had been dead for 12 months. <laughs> Maria Holt was married on Saturday to Mr. Woodfield, a widower with three children, one not 10 months old. And on May 15, 1834, she writes, Mr. George Parker is raving mad, had six men to hold him and escape from them. He has nine children. Later, she adds in the margins, July 16, 1835. He is quite well again. Perhaps she is trying to reassure herself that things could be worse or that they will get better and that life does indeed go on. She will wax lyrical about her former days and her happy happiness of spending carefree moments with family and friends, even when the plight of James and Mary so far away do not dampen her spirits. September 1835, spent a very pleasant day at Renworth Castle, a gypsy party, Mrs Beaumont and a party from Leamington met us. We had a fizzer and danced on the green by Caesar's Tower. We lunched, dined and went to tea at Leamington. The cold cotillion spread on the grass was delightful. I never ate anything with greater appetite or spent a day more delightfully. I was well and the recollections of my former days happily spent there rose on my memory as fresh as ever when I was young and gay, and the ruins are much fallen into decay. I looked on those my Mary painted and dwelt on her form and features and of poor James, but they like the pageants of yours are swept away. Louisa was in full spirits and so was Tom and William indeed all. Emma Greatwood and Mary Williams were of the party, and only, four, and only 14 of us, and we made a fire, which was very comfortable. We played cards by it. There were several who rolled down the hill. None got hurt. Only a few trousers and his bursts and petticoats torn. Got home at half past 12, and it was a beautiful moonlit evening. It was not long, however, before illness and calamity once again struck the family. September 15th at the Sully Hall races sent up for Emma Greatwood to accompany us. She was very ill, was sickened in the night with something approach, approaching apoplexy and, spent, and sent immediately for Mr Bartlett, who bled her. Fortunately, her sister was awake and hurt her, or no doubt she would have died. She is something better. Mr C, Mrs James Brown and myself went to the races and it began to rain heavily at one o'clock and continued more or less all afternoon. Thomas was on horseback. Charles Mucklow drove his wife, Louisa, and at nine o'clock, Thomas and the boy, who is an employee of James of uh, William Chapman, who doesn't actually ever get a name, he's just known as the boy, took the gig to fetch Tom from George at Sully Hill, where he had dined with 60 others after the races. They were to run into the drunken man, they were to run, they were run into by a drunken man in a vehicle and took off their wheel. Charles was dragged 50 yards, his clothes were cut all to pieces, but no bones both bones broken. The boy and the horse went who knows not where, and we heard at 12 o'clock they had been stopped up a lane. And wonderful to tell that no limbs broke, only very much bruised, and the horse was not hurt, but the gig knocked all to pieces. The boy was put to bed at the spread eagle, and our fright, you may suppose, expecting the boy to be brought home a corpse. I stopped at Greet till three in the morning, my head distracted with anxiety. The next day. My head is very bad. Charles M is better though very stiff and bruised. The poor boy is very ill. On the 17th she writes, Thomas's poor boy is not able to stand. It is a wonder he escaped with his life. All's well as without bones broken, as well as without bones broken. He was dragged more than a quarter mile. He could not extricate himself. His foot was jammed in the step and the step in the wheel. They were obliged to cut his boot and saw a part of the gig to extricate him. He held with his little hands by the axle tree, or he may have been killed. He is a good, pretty boy, and most active and clever, and everybody is sorry. Returning to the troubles in Van Diemen's Land in late September 1835, she writes the following. Fanny tells me of the inconveniences Harry, Henry has been put to, Sir Henry Edwards. It is not having his debts paid to him by old vets due to him from Hobart Town. It is a scandalous thing with his, life, with his large family. Fanny said they should think Mary would not be aware that Henry, 
that Henry Edwards' debts have not been paid. Oh, Mr A is honourable to send him no remittance with his large family. No, no one can think of how much it hurts me. I dare not name Highbout Town hardly before Mr E unless he begins first. I wish they would pay him. The Betzers have the farm and all the property swallowed up in it. September 29. Godso has received a letter from my dear Mary. There is one come from Louise of first she has ever received. I could not touch my breakfast till I had read Godso's. Sometimes I laughed and sometimes I cried. I say, poor James, what is he doing, I wonder? I fear too, for Mary's health is not good. So many pangs came to mind. Mr C is just up and the letter is all about the dear children. He cannot eat his breakfast till he has read it, and he is laughing at Mary's description of Morton as never read anything with more delight. He, like myself, can read it quite well, though he's crossed over, and only at night such letters, letters try my eyes, and having read one after having read it for the 150th time. Your father is just reading of your dancing in the New Zealand there, and he cried, Good God! He's highly amused at your description of the characters. A tear now falls from his eyes at the short sentence, Poor James. I wish indeed he was with his family in England, but till their debts are paid, he cannot come. One has to wonder what Mary's thoughts were upon first reading her mother's diaries. Did she, did, did she too shed tears of reading of her father's family's troubles? Did she share the grief of absent loved ones and was she shocked by her mother's comments on what was occurring in Van Diemen's land? We will never know, but I can tell you that there is much more to come. To find out what becomes of Anne Floyd, Thomas, Humphrey, James, Mr C, Fanny Louisa, William and the host of other characters we have, we have met, you will need to join me for the next part, which I believe is going to be in August during National Family History Month, when we will delve further into Anne Floyd's life as she negotiates the loss of her husband, the saga, and it is the saga, of James Everett Chapman and his wife Eliza, her continued grief over Mary Morton's absence, her daughter's grief as she suffers her own losses, as well as the continued observations of the world around her, including her opinion upon seeing the new queen in person for the first time. Thank you. Questions? Oh, yeah, questions? Anyone got a question? No, I don't. Please ask some questions. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm known as the Syria Warlord. Come on. I'm interested in the Betts family. Are you now? Because, yeah, um, um... Well, not another one. Yeah. Well, I get to watch if you come up with another one, do I? <laughs> <laughs> no, but they, they moved to Sydney when... They did, she, yeah. She birthed her and how many children? Oh, that's a... I have 13 children, yeah. Henry Curzon and yeah. Henry Curzon birth beds, yeah. That was his second marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he is quite well known in Parramatta and all the rest. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So know. there is a letter which I have not finished transcribing yet, um, but I'm working on. There is a letter um, in the collection, the Oldport collection, that is from Henry and, sorry, it's from Joseph, and it, a lot of it has to do with Henry and their father and the fallout that they had before Joseph emigrated yes, here to Van Diemen's Land. Yeah, you would know that letter quite well. And it's quite interesting because the theory, the what I get from it, from what I've read so far, is that um, Henry Curzon was, it must be the name, it's got to be the name, surely, it's Curzon business, was not the best fellow at business and kept running into trouble and running up debts and doing all sorts of things. So in the end, the all ports were pretty much left with nothing in England and that's why Joseph came out, one of the reasons why he came out, to try and recoup the family's losses so to speak. But I was talking to a lady who was um, descended from the, the All Ports of New South Wales and she said that that's the story the family heard too, that Henry Curzon had, you know, even when he was here he would he made a name for himself in his art and working, at the, working with the MacArthur's and things but he would run up huge debts and he had a gambling problem and all sorts of things so you know. No, it is the name. It's the name. The curse. The name. <laughs> it's the curse and curse. Oh, that's a good title. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions, comments? Nothing. No, it wasn't that boring, was it? Come on. <laughs> Nothing. You need a family tree. So yeah. Do you know? I did. I did try and do one. Yeah, 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 no, I did, I did actually have a draft family tree, but it, 
didn't translate properly to my slides because I couldn't do it. But basically, I turned into a nightmare. Hats. Yeah, I'll do one by August. You'll have a beautiful one by August. Oh, you'll need one for August because we we delve into all. We have all sorts of people coming in and going out, and Louisa's yeah. husband dies, and she marries someone else, and then where does he fit in? And all the thousands of children that are born, and who comes back, and who doesn't, who gets married, and who jilts who, and it's all very. But they've been fairly wealthy because they had a fair social life. Yeah, they weren't they weren't poor. Yeah, but she can wail yeah. the state of the coach industry because of the trains. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. They just they weren't they weren't as affluent as they once were when her father was alive. So I think it was a drop in standard of living oh, okay. that she had trouble adjusting to. Um, whereas under her father, when her father was alive, and he was obviously the overseer of everything, quite a few businesses, um, things were obviously running better for you know whatever reason, many and varied. Um, but she yeah, so she I think did bemoan the fact that she was she was being living in this standard. She you know grown up in this standard. They were, they were public. They were Republicans, so they you know she grew up in a pub. They ran a pub, so they were working people, but they were well-off working people, and yet when her father died, she lost a lot of that yeah. extra yeah. that she had coming in for various reasons, and then she had to answer to her brother for pretty much everything which she did not like at all. But that continued on. Down that down continued down. on. The whole family, all yep. the women yep. were in the inheritance law, yep. put in trust, yeah. and then the, the capital, mm -hmm. the interest, yep. then the capital reverted back. Yeah, except if you're Mary Everett, then you didn't have to worry about anything. You just got control of it. He must have liked her future husband Samuel Partridge, even though he did like to bleed people quite a bit. Anyway, I can understand now why Mary Morton in third time. Yes. Writes all about the first few pages. Yes. It's yes. Like reading the Mercury, you know, the dresses and all the rest. Yeah. So Mary Morton later in the 1850s writes a journal for her son Morton, who actually travels back to the continent back to England and visits the family and then travels into Paris and things. So obviously she got the idea from her mother. She did try and give Curzon a diary for his 21st birthday for him to write. It didn't last terribly long. There were a few bits and pieces in there, but not great. But yeah, no, that's that's why. If you want to read Mary Morton's journals, they are very similar in a lot of ways to the ones that her mother wrote, all about interactions and social occasions and families and people being born and people being married and people dying. and life going on and things going wrong and things going right and yeah yes thank you very much thank you we wait with faith <laughs> <laughs> and the following one well we'll see yeah. thanks everybody thank you